Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Network. Today, my guest is Scott Landis, who's with Infrastructure Resources. Thanks for joining me, Scott. Yeah, thanks for having me. Scott, I'm going to go through your background because you uh, have been a business owner. It looks like an entrepreneur for a long time. You had Rhino Marking and Protection Systems for over 31 years as the president and CEO. And uh, you also worked at Carsonite International as a market manager. How did you get into the infrastructure world and how did you get into entrepreneurship? Um, yeah, well, good, good question. I, <laughs> I got into kind of infrastructure or damage prevention, you know, the, the normal way. Uh, I had a buddy in college whose dad started Carsonite and he was badgering me for a few years to come work for them. And <clears throat> As it turns out, I was uh, selling computers way back in the early 80s, and uh, it was a new computer system, and nobody wanted to, to buy them. All the innovators had bought them, and now I'm going, huh, this is kind of a problem when you're on commission. So I finally said, yeah, I'll go out and listen. And as it turns out, they, um, they manufactured utility markers, so flat fiberglass marker posts. It was kind of a brand new technology at the time, and, and so... I went out to Carson City and worked for them, and that got me involved in, you know, protecting the buried infrastructures and the one calls. And then in terms of entrepreneur stuff, I had had all kinds of little side things over the year. My mom tells me I used to try and sell Holly door to door when I was like eight or nine or something. But, yeah. um, you know, nothing really turned into too much. And then fortunately, I got fired at Carsonite. Ooh. And uh, had no plan and uh, no actual bank account. And so I had to uh, dream something up rather quickly. And uh, that turned into Rhino. Uh, originally, it was just um, kind of a consulting business. I was uh, acting as the national sales manager on a commission basis for several companies who wanted to sell the utilities. And over time, after I swore I would never get into manufacturing, we ended up with an 80,000 square foot plant extruding plastic and molding plastic. And wow. anyway, so I've been in it ever since the early 80s. <laughs> wow, what a cool story. We're going to dig into that. That's a that's that's fantastic. So you've you basically started learning about business, just being in it with Carsonite, you got fired and then you didn't have a job like you didn't have sounds like money. You didn't have like any income yeah. like then you had to start something from scratch though can you elaborate on what that felt like yeah sure it was you know i think we had an 18 month old uh and a three-year-old at the time so 90 uh about about that and yeah. uh, um fortunately my wife had a you know a decent job anyway so um because i went from making decent money to zero yeah. um and that again with no with no bank account but what you know what i did was the job offers i had i had a few pretty good ones but they were moving or being on the road all the time and i said i'm not doing that so i thought my skill set was i knew the utility industry and i knew it was really difficult to sell a new product to utilities yeah and so most companies give up because it's a really long sales cycle and yeah. um so, um, it, you know, it can work through manufacturers reps if you have patience and that's the part I thought I knew. So I went to a number of different manufacturers and said, Hey, I'll be your part time national sales manager. It's only going to cost you a fraction of the amount, but it's going to take a year or two before we get anywhere. And, and, uh, somehow I talked four or five people into doing that and, uh, started with, with that. And then, you know, gradually over time started to see the need for some products that weren't out there and kind of started by having them made uh, for me and then doing more in-house and then eventually, you know, morphed into the whole manufacturing thing. Wow. That's so uh, leveraging manufacturer reps is really interesting because that's a common theme in the infrastructure world partnerships of, you know, mm -hmm. businesses, because it is a long sales cycle and those are all relationship based. Right. So yep. where do you, where did you see the challenges uh, when you were, and I'm kind of pivoting into like your business now at Rhino, the challenges of like staffing up and, and building the business. What, what are some of the experiences you had back then when you were building that business? Yeah, it was, uh, it was really tough. And I also got really lucky. Uh, 
the first quasi employee was literally after about a month, a, a buddy of mine that I had sold computers with had gotten laid off and, um, wasn't doing anything. And I said, Hey, uh, Chuck, why, why don't you, why don't you come down to Ames, Iowa with me and go to this Midwest energy association. You can hang around and help me in the booth. <laughs> he said, Oh yeah. Oh, okay. I got nothing else to do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, he came down and he, he actually, uh, really enjoyed it. And, um, uh, so then I said, well, this is awesome. Why don't you, why don't you actually become part of this and come to work? I, I can pay like 12 grand. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, fortunately said yes. I had a high threshold for pain. And, uh, so, you know, he was just, he was just awesome. You know, one of those guys, you don't have to tell to do anything, right? He just goes and, and has it down. and was passionate about damage prevention and, and actually is, you know, was with me for about 10 or so years, but he's actually still in, in the industry to, today. And so I, I got really lucky. And then um, pretty much the next employees were um, uh, my uh, aunt, my wife's aunt and her, her husband, you know, to, so I'm getting this cheap labor who were awesome, you know, old school work ethic, get everything yeah. done. And, you know, there's no way I would have been able to, to hire market employees and, um, so that was, that was really, really huge. And, and eventually another buddy I went to college with, um, came on board and actually he just retired, uh, last November. So, oh, wow. uh, so I got, I got super lucky, super lucky. Yeah. That's, that's a really cool story. So was your mom a part of that too? I know you mentioned your mom, like. <laughs> no, cause she was out in California. So it was too hard okay. for me to enlist her to work. Otherwise I probably would have tried. Yes. <laughs> what did you, uh, what did your mom instill in you that you, you, you brought with you? from, you know, your experience in business? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it was, it was accidental. You know, this is back a few years ago and she was, uh, my birth father, my actual last name is Alciati, not Landis, my birth last name. And, um, unfortunately my father got spinal meningitis and encephalitis when I was about four and he ended up, um, she ended up having to make him a ward of the state because he, he had reoccurring amnesia and wouldn't remember to come home. And, you know, it was a, it was very sad and a nightmare. I don't obviously remember much of it, but the, the net result was, so she became a single mom from wow. when I was you know, four to about 10. And so she still had to work. She was a teacher. So the, the accidental thing she installed in me is, you know, surviving on your own because she didn't have time. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, that was just a big deal when, you know, when you're on your own at an, at an early age and not on my own, obviously she took care of us. Right, right. you know, um, uh, so I don't know, it was kind of a subtle thing, but it was, it was a big impact. And I did forget to, to mention that while I didn't get my mother to work for us, I also did get my mother in law to work for us. So, okay. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I, that's funny. You said that about being young and having your mom working. My mom was the same. And I, I was like, I want to learn how to make money. I would think I was eight or nine. I'm like running a paper route. I, I, I met up with this one kid who had a paper route. I'm like, look at all this yeah. cash you have in a roll. I was like, this is amazing. Right. So I can, I can definitely relate where the entrepreneur started oh. for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's a great point because my stepfather, she remarried when I was 10. Um, I, I never really got, got along with or had much of a relationship with he was, uh, I went from basically zero rules and a free range kid to like, you know, a prison camp, you know, so it was a rather dramatic difference. Um, but the big upside with him was it was like, I'm not giving you any money allowance. Right. No, I'm not giving you allowance. If you want something, you got to earn it. I was like, like I'm nine. <laughs> so like you, I, you know, I had a paper out and I was, I was, uh, cleaning dishes and stuff at the local bakery when I was 14 and you know, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't think anything of it. It's like, well, I wanted money. This is real simple. You have to do something to get it. And yeah, uh, you know, so it was, it was, it was a great lesson, even though, like I said, I didn't have a great relationship with him. Some of the stuff he made me do ended up having some, some great ripples. Yeah. That's funny. Now I, my kids get allowance for doing chores in the house and I'm like, you guys have bills. Like you got to pay the electric bill too. So that's coming out of like, they're trying to learn economics right now. And it's, it's they're like, that's not fair. I'm like, well, that's life. You know, if I got to pay you for chores, you got to pay for the bills. <laughs> so yeah. uh -huh. that's yeah, funny. Uh, so yeah, that's a great history. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It's, it's, it's really uh, awesome to hear, you know, the way you've 
learn to be an entrepreneur and, and grow into a you know rhino marking marking and protection system so during that business i would imagine you mentioned something about you didn't want to ride around all the time what did you what did you mean by that uh well the, the, the buddy at carson i didn't want me to you know come out and originally go into sales and literally he would go on the road in a car for 68 weeks at a time making sales calls like you know, I'm not afraid to make some sales calls, but I do have a life and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, a wife and two kids. And so, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. So uh, it didn't mind a little travel. Yeah. Um, so, but of course then with, with Rhino, we obviously I was on the road a lot and it, it is. And, and Chuck, who was the, the original guy with me was, was on the road a lot. He, he was single and didn't have kids. So um, it was easier for him and he really loved traveling. For me, it was a little bit harder, and it's kind of ironic. I always appreciated the fact that my wife was, you know, working and taking care of the kids. But until now, having the two grandsons at about age three and five, and we take them for a few days at a time, yeah. and then I think, holy cow, how in the world did she do this by herself full time while I was traveling and working? It's like, I thought I appreciated it before, but boy, do I appreciate it now even more. <laughs> It's so true. It, it, we take that for granted when I travel too. you know, for five days out of the week, you know, I'd be home on a Friday, you know, Saturday, Sunday, and then back on the road on Monday. But yeah, that I'd have the kids as soon as I got home Friday to Sunday, my wife worked on the weekends and it was, it was literally, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> so being on the road was nice sometimes, but, it, but the, the problem with that, you don't have a relationship with your kids. You kind of mentioned that, like right. you wanted, you wanted to have a life, you know, relationship with your kids and stuff. It sounds like so. Those are super important. So, you ended up selling the business to Trident Solutions. Uh, looks like in twenty twenty one. How was that? Like as you built this up, you you know, after thirty one years, you have a passion for the business. I obviously, it's like your baby, right? You started it, you built yeah. it. What is that like when you go to sell a, a company? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a loaded um, question. Yes. You know, fortunately, I've been part of an organization called Vistage for like 20 years, which is business owners and kind of these small groups, you know, and we meet okay. a full day a month. So I, I had seen many of my fellow members sell and go through these things. So, uh, you know, my eyes were wide open, or, or at least I thought they were. Yeah. Um, and my plan always was to sell at some point because... I didn't want to be a Walmart reader when I retired and I, you know, all, all the money was going back into the business. So, um, yeah. but it, it wasn't on the horizon at the time. And then they, they really uh, came and pursued me aggressively and they were creating this roll up of a, kind of a, a marking superpower. Okay. And so I thought, well, this is, could really be good for Rhino's future for the industry. And, you know, the time to sell is when somebody really wants to buy, right? Yeah. Uh, and not when you want to sell. <laughs> um, so I ended up, uh, you know, going through with it and, and I, I don't regret it, but I, but I will say, um, as I had seen with uh, some other friends and, and in private equity, you know, sometimes what you hear uh, going into it isn't really what happens. And so, um, you know, I was told, you know, we're, we love your brand, your core values, your culture. Um, and that was good for, uh, you know, at least a couple of weeks before that got completely dismantled. Ooh. And so, um, yeah, that was really hard because I was, I was there for a year, uh, part-time it was 50% there and 50% IR and, you know, everybody's got the right to run a business how they see fit. Right. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to rain on their parade, but it was night and day from the way we had done things. And so that was really hard to watch and, and be a part of. And like I said, it, it, it might be a great way, but it wasn't the way I did it. And right. so it was uh, for the first six months, I really um, worked hard. And then the, the next six months after that first six months, I realized, oh, I see. They actually don't want my opinion <laughs> and I'm, this is just something they have to do to make it look good to investors and so i realized all right so i'm going to answer any questions when you call yeah <laughs> but other than that that's done so it, you know it it wasn't fun to see and i it, you know i'm still obviously in communication with a lot of the rhino people because that's what makes everything click is is people and uh, yeah 
but it is what it is. Hey, that, that very valuable information. I think a lot of people need to understand that in infrastructure because we are getting mobbed by private equity companies right now trying to buy small family owned companies. That, and, and, you know, I look at it as they're trying to monopolize it, which is, I get it. That's private mm -hmm. equity way, right? But there mm -hmm. is a, a side effect to that, right? Then you yeah. just talked about it. It's like, they're not going to continue the way it's been before. It's going to be completely different. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, well, it's not fair to lump them all together, but that was my experience. Right, right, so right, right. right. Yeah. And, that, and I just, I just see that now as how it's, you know, just kind of that because so much money coming in infrastructure now, it's like the focus is get big right. fast. Right. Yeah. So, but very cool stuff about uh, Rhino and your history there. And I'm going to talk about what you're doing now in infrastructure resources and, you know, talking about safety, damage prevention, things like that. Looks like you have a, a massive following there at infrastructure resources. How did that come about? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, back in the, in the 90s, we really, uh, as an industry, as a damage prevention industry, it was... Um, I guess my kind of definition is you really become an industry when you have a, um, a magazine and, and like a trade show. Yeah. Because you kind of need those two things to get everybody together and really be an industry. And at the time, there was a magazine uh, um, called Underground Focus, which was kind of the, the magazine of damage prevention and kind of the one call part of the industry I'm locating. Um, and I had helped the publisher uh, write a book on on marking that that Carson and I had commissioned. So I got to know him, and then when all of a sudden I was self employed out of nowhere with no money for marketing, I I went to him and said, Hey, you know what? I I be willing to write a, a column in every issue on identification. Thinking like, who would actually read that? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but he said, Oh, great. And as it turns out, people actually read it, and I I. I I can't believe it, but at any rate, um, <laughs> my former employer complained, which was which was fascinating to me because first of all, they didn't buy ads for him, so you know what? Right. Go pound sand. Like, right. <laughs> and I wasn't pitching any products; I was pitching the value of marketing and all that kind of stuff. Right. Anyway, but the great part is he came to me and said, "Well, they're complaining, and so um, because you're volunteering, I'm going to change this. And uh, I'll, I'll, how about if I give you a free full page ad?" in every issue for writing the column. I said, wow, thank you, Carson. Yeah, you can't <laughs> so, beat that. Um, so anyway, that, that worked well. And I, I kind of helped this Ron Rosencrantz with, with marketing a little bit, just because I liked marketing and I wanted to help him succeed. Um, and then I realized we really need a trade show. He needed a trade show as a magazine hmm. kind of to, to be part of. And a friend of mine uh, had a trade show company so I went out to lunch with him and said, hey, Craig, I, I think our industry needs a trade show. And he said, well, you know, let's do a survey. So we, I, I got Ron to do a survey in the magazine and the, came back and said, yeah, we should really have a trade show. So um, I helped my buddy create this uh, trade show called the Damage Prevention Convention. Oh, nice. And uh, I like it, it. Was, it was successful. Uh, Except that he he had the audacity to sell the business. What? <laughs> a year or two later, and the new people who came in. So again, back to kind of these these acquisitions. Things. The first people kind of hands off. Greg stayed there and ran it. Everything was the same, and then they flipped it again in about a year. And the next people came in, and they could care less about damage prevention of the industry. And so wow. I said, I can't be associated. So I'm out. So it, it ended up going away. But in, in the meantime, then I said, well, I like this trade show thing. Yeah. And so uh, the guy who, owned, who had bought Underground Focus Magazine, um, we started an outdoor trade show at, at the site of his staking university where he, he taught locating. Yeah. Um, and it was fascinating and, and it really worked well unless you were looking to make money. Um, and so after a year of doing that, he said, I, I never want to do another trade show as long as I live. And I said, well, I kind of like the trade show thing. And I was helping him with the magazine, but we weren't, you know, quite on the same page. And I said, well, tell you what, I'll pay you for the show. I'll pay your losses. Um, and I'll give up my phantom stock in the magazine and I'll do the show and you do the magazine. And hmm. so that was 2003. And that's, that's kind of when I, um, 
launched then uh, what became un underground, I mean, excuse me, infrastructure uh, resources. And um, so we, we started with outdoor con outdoor shows. And then actually out in LA, we started one at the LA County Fairgrounds that combined outdoor excavation in the middle of the horse track. Oh, cool. And, uh, along with some sessions and some displays. And one, one of my favorite memories there is like, you know, obviously we get utilities located, right? Before we do anything, yeah. we're being, that's the whole industry. And, but it's a private fairgrounds. So so the utilities are, are all private. Um, and as it turns out, my uncle was the former operations director there, which is kind of how I learned about it. So I go to the track and said, so are there any buried facilities out in the middle of the racetrack? Oh, no, there's nothing out there. And I'm looking at so the whole thing surrounded by lights. So that seems highly unlikely. <laughs> right. So I call my uncle and he says, oh, God, it's littered with high voltage lines and fiber optic cable for the bedding. And so I, I was kind of mad. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Their operations guy I said, okay, well, my uncle seems to think there's things out here. And if you say there's not, I'll tell you what, you're going to sign right here that says you're accepting 100% of all liability for anything that gets hit personally. Yeah. Uh, um, well, maybe we do have a map. Maybe we didn't. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, there were a lot of things. <laughs> were they really? Wow. That's... So, anyway, at that point, that it was, again, kind of, we got people to come, but we couldn't figure out how to make money. Yeah, because we were it was basically free to come. And anyway, um, right then the um, Common Ground Alliance, which was brand new uh, in 2000, so still fairly new, and this is 2006. Yeah, um, uh, was looking for a new event to to hold their annual meeting. You know, to just have hosted, and so we put in a. Um, we put in a proposal to do it and basically all you're doing is giving them all kinds of free stuff and then the hope is because they're having their annual meeting there, you'll get some extra attendees and, right um and they accepted it uh partially because we were willing to put their name on the front of the show to help them build a brand ah nice so you know you, you were talking about oh yeah brands, right? I, <laughs> so, all about that so, so from 2006 and it's so, 2020, I mean, there were millions and millions of impressions of this CGA excavation safety conference, right? Yeah. So we really, really built that product, which was great because I was also very, very involved in the Common Ground Alliance and co-chair of the education committee for four years. And so it was great, but then uh, they changed uh, presidents and a few board members and uh, not, I don't want to get into the details, but basically they decided they wanted to uh, put on their own event and make money as opposed to just come to our event. Okay. And uh, so they decided to start their own event. And of course, when they did that, looking back, it's like, oh, this idea of letting them put their name on our show wasn't the best idea ah. because everybody remembered our event as the CGA event. Mm. So when they started their new show, most people thought, this has been around forever and we were new. Wow. So, you know, live and learn. Hey, it's a, it's a free country. There, you know, I don't know that it's good for damage prevention having two events in the same time frame, but again, it's a free country. So it, it is. Wow. What a story. I, it's a, it's interesting in business how you can get kind of taken advantage of when you're doing something good to build something and then somebody pulls the rug out from under you basically to do that. That's, that's business. I yeah. get it. But, but you know, it just creates more opportunities, and you know it, we, that's the best way to look at it. It created another opportunity, and I think that's where everyone needs to get their mindset. Yeah. It's like every problem presents an opportunity. You know, that's yeah. just the way it goes. And, if you don't do that, you can't be an entrepreneur because you'll you'll go crazy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so we had our a magazine that that you know was focused on damage prevention, print and digital, and then we also have an annual excavation safety guide that there's a seven or eight million out there in print now that's an annual guide pretty much for excavators yeah. uh, to you know tell them how to do things and uh we actually also started a uh, a group called pasa which is the pipeline ag safety line so this is super cool and had zero to do with me right yeah <laughs> so, 
actually one of the one of the Rhino team guys at the time and, and Whitney, who was our VP of operations, where they realized that it was really hard to reach farmers and ranchers with the safe excavation message. Okay. And as it turns out, um, every county in every state that has a land grant college um, has a county agriculture agent that is funded by the land grant college. Oh, wow. And their only mission in life is to help farmers and ranchers, you know, uh, be more productive, be safer. So, so they're really respected because they don't have any other mission. They're not selling anything. And um, so these guys, Ricky and Chris, figured out how to connect with this group. And, and so we linked up with the, the national organization of these ag agents. And so now every year we go to their conference a week. It's kind of a train the trainer thing. Yeah. So we train all these county ag agents who are loving to get this new information they can take out there. So it's had a really big impact. And, you know, we got a lot of pipelines who joined up with us to help make wow. it possible. That's that's a really unique way of getting to market, right? I mean, you found the yep. uh, like a, a place to to you know provide a solution, which is safety, obviously. Yep. What what is it, you know? Because I'm I'm not too familiar with excavation safety and damage prevention. Can you be more specific on what the problem is there? Because I don't, you know, I know utilities, underground utilities, people get hurt, you know. But what are some of the big problems going on with that? Uh yeah. Well, that's a that's a, it could be a long answer, but <laughs> we, general, got, we got a little bit of time. We're good. <laughs> yeah, well, the general focus of, um, of it is basically making sure that excavators, whether it's a homeowner or a professional excavator, uh -huh. when they're digging, they don't hit a buried cable or pipe. Got it. And of course, they don't want to, right? right. And, and the utilities don't want them to, but you know, the repercussions can be just crazy. I mean, we, we think of gas and oil because if you hit that, you could have an explosion or pollution. But I had a friend in, you know, works for a big fiber company, sent me a text the other day and they just got uh, hit. And he said um, that he's guessing by the time it's all said and done, uh, it's going to be $2 million in damages. <clears throat> wow. So, um, it's a big deal, but, you know, also, you know, if you really, that's why we say excavation safety too, because keeping those excavators safe is the number one thing right. in public. And then, you know, obviously the dollars and cents and keeping networks up is great. And, you know, you're, you're a little bit more oriented towards some of the water stuff with the infrastructure. And yeah. It's funny because in the, in the water business, a lot of times they don't pay as much attention because uh, not through negligence, but water pipelines are often real deep. Right. So they don't get hit as often. Uh, they're not forced by law to mark them. Mm. In, in, in most people's mind, people don't die if you hit them, although it has happened. Right. Uh, people have died because of a water main being hit. Um, but also, you know, when this water main, you know, potable water line gets hit, bacteria can get in it and there can be all kinds of, of repercussions that, that are pretty significant. Yeah. So, there's a really solid reason not to hit anything that's underground. And so yeah. that's what kind of encompasses damage prevention and excavation safety is that joint mission to avoid that. So the electro electrical lines are the biggest, obviously, problem. Because if an excavator hits an electric line, it's going to be grounded by its tires, right? But you still have a potential where someone jumps off the rig, touches the truck. I don't know. I'm just running through a scenario I, I, how you could get hurt in that situation. But yeah, that seems to be... Yep. Yeah, you're, you're asking right along, okay. you know, it's interesting because they also are not in, in general, not as proactive about, um, damage prevention for buried lines. Okay. They're super aggressive about making sure people don't hit the aerial lines. Right. I've seen that. It, they tag them in every, yeah. Yeah. It, which is awesome, but they're not as focused on the underground stuff. And because of what you said, partially, I think because most of the time the person who hits it is grounded. And so they, the, the, a buddy in the telephone industry said most of the time the injuries he sees is it, the person hits it with a post hole digger or a shovel and it's broken jaws oh. because they hit that and it goes it straight shocks. up. Oh yeah, I can. It's just like electric in the house. house. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, so, but I do think there's a trend coming. You know, they're, they're starting to pay more attention to the underground stuff. So I think you're going to see a lot more focus on that in the, in the coming years. Plus a lot of electric utilities are starting to work with fiber at the same time. Okay. And, um, so it's gas and oil that are, that are by far the, the most focused 
on damage prevention and protecting the public. Yeah, because that could be a huge explosion, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to gas. Uh, you know, I've volunteered firefighting for a while, so I know those situations yeah. all the time for where sure. someone would hit a gas main and, and it's just blowing out gas everywhere. And I'm like, yeah. what is, you know, and I, after I researched, I realized it was too dense of a gas it, to explode, but yes. there is times yeah. if it's a certain mixture, right oxygen in there, it's over. Like, it's, yeah. it's it an is. explosion. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay. Now I've learned way more about the excavation and safety industry. I, I, this is really good. So how would you um, kind of, I guess, talk about, you know, different ways of damage prevention? What are some of the problems within these communities that they, they, it almost seems like no one knows where these utilities are. So what, what's going on there? And, and we got like five more minutes, but what is that? All yeah. About? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you're right, it's a big issue. So, uh, yeah, I have to mention that in, in 2007, uh, 811 got, got enacted. So, like 911, now you, in the U.S., you can dial 811 and it will take you to the, the one call center in, in that state, wherever you're calling from. Okay. And so then you, you can request a, a locate so people can come up and put paint and flags on the, on the ground. Um, which is a huge help but even even better you can go to click before you and okay. that's a digital version of it because lots of times a contractor could be calling from one state and the work might be in another okay. um and, and so the you know in online is where everyone's going anyways so that that's a really big help but the, the big hole one of the holes in the system is that the only locates that will be done and, and the one call doesn't do any locates they just tell their members that there's going to be digging activity and their members go out and locate or have a contractor locate. Yeah. But not all states require everybody to be a member. So, uh, you know, like water is, is frequently not a member. Cities may not be members. DOTs may not be members. So the poor contractor may, may think, even though they're told when they call, you know, that only our members are getting located, um, they may mistakenly think there's nothing else there. And it also doesn't cover private utilities, like I was mentioning right, the racetrack. Right. Okay. I think it's something crazy. Like forty percent of the buried cables and pipes are actually private. Um, wow, that's a lot. So back to your point about finding them. So it's a massive push right now um, to be finding, to be getting it all mapped accurately, so that you know down the road you'll be able to just look at a map. But for instance, in Australia. They, they don't they don't go out and do a locate when when you're going to excavate um, within minutes of you saying I'm going to dig you actually have all the maps right there on your phone. Um, wow! It's then your your responsibility as a contractor to, <clears throat> to not hit. Wow! Um, okay. So different models in different parts of the world and um, sounds like we're a little behind. <laughs> yeah, you know, like everything, we're behind in some areas and ahead in others, and you know that's why that's why we're globally focused. Because you know what? Shockingly, we don't have all the answers here in the U.S. There never are. Isn't that there amazing? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm learning that more and more as as I talk to people like yourself. It's a it's a whole other world out there outside of the United States, but uh, sounds like it's more efficient in certain situations too. Yeah. Um, so, kind of ending, we we're pretty much out of time, Scott. How you mentioned something when we started about infrastructure resources changing to a new name, you know that kind of stuff. And then, how can people get a hold of you if they want to do, you know, get get more information about your services? Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks for asking. That. Yeah, so we're actually by the time this lands, we will have changed uh, the company name from Infrastructure Resources to Excavation Safety Alliance, which is one of our brands right now. Where we have, in, in fact, everybody's welcome to join their free monthly virtual town halls on hot topics and, and in the true town hall format because lots of people out there can't get to conferences and face-to-face -face stuff. So right. um, those have been hugely successful over the last year and we realized, well, that's really our mission is this excavation and safety alliance. Everything we do is trying to connect people and get education out there. And, and our mission is saving lives through education. Um, so it's really a great umbrella for our excavation safety magazine, our yeah. excavation safety guide, and our global excavation safety conference. Uh, so it. if you go to excavationsafetyalliance.com, um, everything will be there that we do, and tons of it's free. So yeah, uh, we love to have you stop it. That, <laughs> you invited me to the town hall, and I look forward to joining one of those at some point in time here in the future. Um, those have been great. I mean, I've seen a trend of that and, and I, I do want to talk to you more about 
branding down the road. So I think you and I will probably do another podcast at some point in time here sure. if you're cool with it. But, yeah. uh, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But, um, you know, the thing is, is we need to be able to get that information out there online nowadays. Everything's going digital, you know, and I talk about yeah. that in my posts and things like that. You've probably right. seen um, those live events are perfect, you know, to get out that information yeah. and have people attend those. So that's that's great. That you're doing yeah, it's it's a new world. I, I, it, it, for two seconds, I'll, I'll, I'll tie into what you said, but our uh, it's interesting because our daughter actually my my shirt I'm wearing here is our I love that shirt. Our daughter's business is uh, she she makes matching clothes for dogs and people. Nice, that's like, awesome. Who uh, knew? But they were actually on the Shark Tank back in 2019. But the reason I mention it is because so it's been awesome for me because I get to watch. Her, who's 34, and her team, which their entire world is digital, right? Yeah. All their marketing, everything they do. And so I'm learning tremendous amounts uh, from them. And, and it's really fun to see. And it's, it's also, I look at it and go, boy, when I was doing marketing, things changed slowly. Now it's like every month, you, you're going to be behind if you don't see what the new thing is in digital marketing. It's, it's moving so fast. And, it, and it, it's going it, to, what I see the trend being is more customized, you know, for each brand is going to have to be a customized marketing pr process. But, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the future is your, what's your digital brand. And, you know, yeah. I, like I said, we could, I, I, I'm out of time, but I want to talk more about that stuff later <laughs> with you. But uh, that's, what's the name of the, your daughter's uh, business? Um, uh, dog threads. Dog threads? Yeah, like clothes, yeah. Nice. They the just rebranded to Good Thomas, but dog threads is the main brand. Okay, yeah. nice. Oh, well, anybody's looking for matching outfits with their pets, there you know where to go. So, Scott, it's yeah. been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us.